I'm in Revelation 4, if you want to open with me. Revelation 4, and verse 1. Very simple verse and simple statement, but loaded with insight, with information. You know, the first three chapters of Revelation are the record of the seven churches, which were in John's day. They were in existence in John's day. First three chapters. Now, the translators of Scripture recognized that there was a subject change between the end of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4. There's, there's a change. So the first three chapters are about what was present in John's day. But chapter 4 and verse 1 is not present in John's day. Let's read it. Let's look at it. Let's see what it says. After this. That's an interesting word, after, and it... It's used many times in the book of Revelation. After this, after this, after this. After what? After the seven churches and the messages to the seven churches and the command of God to me to write it down and send it to the seven churches. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. So does this sound like um, a vision? Come on. John's on the Isle of Patmos. And he's op his, something is opening to him, and a door is opened in heaven. This, this is a vision, okay? A door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet. In other words, this is a loud, booming voice, trumpet-like. Talking with who? Come on. This voice is addressing who? John talking with me, which said, come up hither, come up here. Quotes in vision. Come up hither, and I will show thee things, plural, which must be, what's that word? Now that's a compound word. In, in my Bible, which I really appreciate. This is Elder Vanderman's gift to me. It was the last one they had in the ministry. I asked for it and he gave it to me. Hereafter actually means in the Greek, in the original, in the future. We don't have a problem with that. But we need to talk about here and after because this is a compound word. You, to, to convey what it really is trying to say to us, or speaking to us, you, you have to understand it's two words. There's here, and there's after. Now, I've tried to convey this simple thought, here and after, in my seminars for quite a number of years, and I do it by saying I-N-G and E-D. That's, that's a here and after equation. Okay? Hereafter. It's not easy for people to see that. For example, the Advent pioneers wanted Jesus to come, convinced themselves or allowed others to convince them that Jesus was coming in October of 1844. So someone had to do some real serious Bible searching and digging and studying, and they had to dig outside the Bible for historical information, and they did, and they found a prophecy about the stars falling, and they found a prophecy about great earthquake, and they found a prophecy about and about and about and about. And so they lined them all up, and then they looked for fulfillments. Why did they look for fulfillments? Come on, let's reason it out. Why, why were they looking for fulfillments? Well, let me ask you this. A fulfillment, is that a here or is that an after? Ah. They are looking for the done deal. Okay? How, many, how long have people been looking for the done deal? 
at least Enoch the seventh from Adam. Yeah, I, I mean, come on, come on. It's 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 not a sin to want the end of the story. It's not a sin. God understands the human heart. This is one of the reasons he has hidden the time. Because if God told the disciples, if Jesus told the disciples, I'll be back in a couple of thousand years. Well, call me when you get back. No, 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 no. There's a problem. Now let's, let's expand a little bit on this time situation. When I was about seven or eight years of age, my dad said, son, I'm going to the baseball game in Birmingham. The Birmingham Barons. We had our own baseball team in Birmingham at that time, those years. And my dad and his beer drinking buddies loved to go. They loved to take in the game, have a few beers and a hot dog or two. And I was never invited to go to the ball game until this, this experience, this time. And uh, seven, eight years of age. And my dad said, son, would you like to go with me today? Yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to go. That sounds like big stuff to do. I want to go to see the Barons play. And uh, there we were. We had our tickets with the seat numbers up in the bleachers where you sit and you have to, you know. Anyhow, we had good seats. And you're up higher than the field by half the height of the bleachers. You're, you're up above. And you can, from the seats that we had, you could see the whole field. You could take in all, all the, if the guy was the left fielder, you could see him. And if he was the right fielder, you could, you could take in the whole field. Sometimes if you sit right down too close, you, you can only see. But we had, seems like they were playing Memphis at the time. I don't remember. It doesn't matter. I was a kid, my first experience in a ball game like this, and I see the guy up there and he's, he's standing there and he's clicking his feet together and he's pounding on the base, the home plate, and he's kicking his feet together and he's moving his hat all around and he's chewing and spitting, chewing tobacco and literally, okay? And he's getting ready to bat. And the pitcher is, you know, he's going through all his motions and the catcher is giving him signals and the umpire is right there and the stage is set. And the guy throws the ball. And the guy who was up to bat hit that ball. It wasn't a home run, but it was, it was hit. I mean, he hit that ball. And I'm watching that and I'm seeing it in real time. Okay? And a sp second or a split second or two after that, I hear the <laughs> crack of the bat. And I asked my dad, what was that? He said, son, that's the crack of the bat. Well, what does that mean? Did he crack the bat? Did the bat break when he hit the ball? Or what, what does that mean? Well, when you're seven or eight years old, you don't understand a whole lot about physics yet. And, you know, with my eyes, I was seeing it in real time. I saw it as it happened. But with my ears, I didn't hear it in real time. I did hear it in real time. But it was, come on, what's the word? It was delayed. So how many times have I read this book of Revelation or some portion of Scripture? 
Am I reading it in real time or the crack of the bat? So if I'm a human being, do I want it now or hereafter? Are you listening? And so when people like our good friend Elder Gary Vinden is talking to us this week, he's talking about salvation is full and complete. Everything is done. You know, it's just it, we're just waiting for the Lord to come get us. And I'm saying, no, 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 no. We're waiting on something. What are we waiting on? The crack of the bat. Jesus made the promise way back there, way back here. The promise is made. Even before the foundation of the world, it says, the promise is made. But what are we waiting for? The reality of the promise. The fulfillment of the promise. Now, most people, when they read the Scripture, do everything they can to find an earthquake and a falling of the stars and whatever to prove that it is in whose day? Because it's not friendly to say it hasn't happened yet. Because we don't know when it will happen. So I want to reference the board for a moment with you. We talked about this last week. We want to expand on this. There was war where? We're quoting scripture. There was war in heaven. And Michael and his angels fought. And the dragon or the devil and his angels fought. Okay? This is, is that the crack of the bat? That's reality. I believe that was reality up there. Now we're down here. Here comes the after. What happened up there is said prophetically going to happen down here. Is that friendly to you and me? As long as it's here, And not here. It's friendly. But we find out it's after. We're waiting for something. What are we waiting for? The things that were shown to John in vision to become reality. So here's the question. Don't miss it. Has this already happened? Is that how... John could see something because it's already happened. And all we're waiting for is the crack of the bat. See, that's what most Christians believe about salvation. That's what Adventist pioneers believed about prophecy. It's already happened. And we're just waiting for the consequences. We're just waiting for the crack of the bat. Look, there's a problem here. And the problem is that you and I are here. We're not there yet. And so we write hymns about how it's okay. It's okay. God knows and God's going to encourage us and he's going to hold on to us and so we write hymns the same way the pioneers interpreted the prophecies. The same way. Now I'm going in Revelation again, and I'm going to come over to chapters 10 and 11. And this is going to be 
I, I hope, very interesting to you and me and us. It's fascinating to me. So I'm in chapters 10 and 11 of uh, Revelation. And this would be basically the heart of the book. And it is clear that it is in the judgment. The scene is taking place while the judgment is in session in heaven. The question is, has it already happened? Because that's the Adventist position. For many Adventists, judgment's already started. Judgment is already this. Already, already, already. No, I don't think so. I don't think contextually, scripturally, that's correct. Well, what difference does it make? I'm in chapter 10, verse 1. John said, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, a rainbow on his head, his face as it were the sun, his feet as pillars of fire. Is he seeing or hearing? Thank you, he is seeing. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roars, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now we're into the hearing. Now when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven, saying, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, don't write them down. The angel which I saw stand upon the sea and on the earth lifted up his hand to heaven. Now, we've taken note of this before, just we're going to pass it, but this is Daniel chapter 12. This is verbatim Daniel chapter 12, the beginning of the 12th chapter of Daniel. Mighty angel standing above earth and sea, hands lifted toward heaven, swearing. Verse 6, he swear by him that lives forever and ever who created heaven and the things therein and the earth and the things therein and the sea and the things therein that there should be what? Now. The difference between here and after is time. If time is going to be a thing of the past, then the here will be past and the after will be past. Don't want to lose you, but I'm asking you to put your thinking caps on. There is a day coming, there is a time coming that there should be time, it says, no longer. So if the time is filled full, done, gone, whatever, the here is taken care of and the after is taken care of. Next verse, 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. So here we are, we're talking about hearing. And in the days of the seventh angel, when he blasts the trumpet, the mystery of God should be what? Should be finished. Which you know that we have been accustomed to. Okay, let's, let's keep going here. Verse 7 says, But in the days of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound. What is the sounding that is going to be heard? Let's go on to chapter 11. We're, just, we're in the same vision. Chapter 11. Verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell on their faces and worshiped God and saying, We give you thanks. Now this is a, it's a hymn, it's a, it's a praise hymn. We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power, and what tense is hast reigned? Both exhausted. 
is that accomplished fact? Is this the swing or is this the crack of the bat? Let's go on. We give thee thanks, Lord, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power, authority, and has reigned, E.D. Has taken and has reigned. The tenses are extremely important, I believe, for prophetic reasons, for understanding reasons, and what have you. See, if everything was accomplished 2,000 years ago in this plan of salvation, if the price that was required to be paid was all done 2,000 years ago, um, what are you and I suffering for? It's done. Well, if God had closed the door back then, you and I wouldn't have come along. So he favored us by letting us come along and suffer. You have to understand, if everything was accomplished and done back there, God could have closed the door, shut the deal down, said, this is it, it's finished. Yes, but I wouldn't be in the story, but you wouldn't know it. The fact that you and I are here is evidence that the story is not done, is not completed. We're in, you and I are in the here. The after is still ahead. Now, to me, we're, we're, we're talking about the character of God. We're talking about the personality of God. We're talking about the heart of God. We're trying to understand how he, as the Good Samaritan, could pass down the road, see the fellow hurt, almost unto death, and minister to him, but go on. Now this is played out thousands of times in the Bible. Thousands of times. So Jesus passes from village to village and place to place, and the sick are brought, and Jesus touches them, Jesus speaks to them, Jesus... And they're healed. And they rejoice. And they praise God. Where are they today? What? So was everything finished? No. 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 You and I are waiting for something. What are we waiting for? The crack of the bat. The seventh angel to sound. In the days of the seventh angel, trumpet, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be uh, almost finished. No. Finished. So all that is required to get this picture is in place. To see the struggle, the suffering, all the things that are part of what we call life down here. We can see it. We can taste it. We can feel it, but what we want is for all of that to be. So I'm in 1 Thessalonians 4. Let's look at it. Let's see how this comes together. I'm in 1 Thessalonians 4, and I'm in verse 13. We're, all fami we're familiar with these verses, but we're, we're not... We're, we're not sitting at the ball game waiting for the crack of the bat. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That's all the folk who've gone before us. That you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Sounds like they all get to heaven and how many people believe when you die you go to heaven and that's all right, Jesus will bring you back and he'll put your body and your spirit together. Prepositions 
have a lot to offer. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede or go before, is the Greek word, shall not go before them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the, uh, tell me what the trump of God is. What? It's trumpet. It's an abbreviated word for trumpet. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise. So are we seeing or are we hearing? Is this the here or is this the after? Let me just back up a little bit and tell you of an experience I had in Hermiston, Oregon. Now, I got to Hermiston, Oregon because we had friends who lived there and eventually came to work with us here in the ministry for years, Larry and Dorothy Benjamin. On this particular occasion, we were making a stopover in Hermiston, Oregon. So I made an exit off of the interstate, and I come down, and I turn, and I, I'm on the road going to where Larry and Dorothy Benjamin live and other friends. And all of a sudden, I'm passing the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now, I'd seen the church many times, and I knew it was there, but it caught my eye this time. And it caught my eye because there's a large color canvas banner out in front of the church advertising and inviting the public to come to a prophecy. Okay? And I'm, 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 I'm just I'm riding down the road like this, which I have no business doing, but I, I just, you know, come see, come here. Okay, so when the public comes, and we hope a zillion of them come, when the public comes, what are they going to hear? They're going to hear that the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation are all in the past. Why would anyone reason that way? Come on. I, what is the human condition that would cause a person to reason that way? Because they want the here and they want the after. They don't want the here and the after. Do you, do you understand how the mind works or doesn't work? It's the human experience. So come and we're going to tell you that it's a done deal. We're going to prove to you it's a done deal. Well, if it's a done deal, what are we doing here? For 2,000 years, what are we doing here? Oh, well, you don't have to go 2,000 years, just back to 1844. Oh, I feel better already. Just a moment. Let's, let's look at this, and then we're going to go to 1 Corinthians. For this we say unto you, verse 15, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not go before or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Is this seeing or hearing? Yes. Yes. That's where the here and the after are put together. Has that happened yet? Have the dead in Christ risen yet? No, not in this context. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be without the hereafter. Let's back up to 1 Corinthians and uh, 15. 
let, let's see what the understanding of the apostles, in this case, Paul, what, what the understanding about the here and the after is all about. I think I'll pick it up in verse 51 of 1 Corinthians 15. I want you to see this. And all the time we're trying to say, well, is this seeing the bat and the ball get together, or is this the here and the after put together? All right, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, whoa, that doesn't sound like a delay between seeing and hearing. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when will this here after put together occur? At the last trump or trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. This corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this happens, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, time no longer. That's what we read in Revelation. That's how it's expressed in Revelation. It's the same moment. The dead in Christ are going to rise. Words are not salvation. I don't have to say some magic words in order to gain salvation. So I'm not proposing to anyone, anywhere, anytime, any place that if you don't interpret this properly, you're not going to have a chance. That's not what I'm saying and not what I believe. But words are important. If you're going to describe something, words are important. And there are millions of people, millions, not thousands, there are millions of people who believe and will put banners out on the highway for you telling you, it's all done, it's all done, we're just, we're just here waiting. Well, how long do we have to wait? Well, we're in a tearing time. Well, tearing time from 1844 till now must, you know, how, how many more tarries are we got to have before we get to the time? And so I maintain that if we don't, if, if we don't understand the words that we're using and mouthing, then we don't understand what it means. That day will not come, Jesus said until a message goes to every kindred tongue, nation, and people. Tell me what the message is that has to go. Fear God, give glory to Him for the hour of His... Oh, what is the judgment that is coming? It is Jesus coming into the sanctuary in the judgment hour and going through the motions described in the book of Revelation and here we are, let's go back, chapter 11. Just, we, we, you've, got to, you've got to see this. Is, this. is this the here or is this the after? Or is this where it's all put together? Everything we've been waiting for. So I'm in Revelation 11 and 15. The seventh angel sounded great voices in heaven, the kingdoms of this world are or have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. And He's going to reign now forever. And the 24 elders throw themselves down on their faces to worship and praise God. For what reason? Because He's God? Yes, but because of something He has and is accomplishing and it is happening in front of them. What is it? For thou hast taken to thee thy great judgment or authority and has what? What 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 happens in that moment? Daniel seven says, But the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end. 
and he is, or the guy who gets the deed to the property, his kingdom shall never pass away. This is the theme of Daniel and Revelation. This is the theme. O king, live forever. Could not the wise men, soothsayers, magicians, and astrologers tell the king the dream? No, but there's a God in heaven who can and will, and here it is. God is going to change the times and the seasons and remove kings and set up kings. And by the way, king, God has shown you what shall come to pass in the latter days. See, if, if, you're not, if you're not reading, if you're not seeing with understanding, you get the here's and the after's all out of sorts. And I'm not saying you're lost because you didn't work it out. I'm only saying you put yourself in a position to believe things about God that are not exactly correct. True experience. I believe it was in South or Central America, but South America somewhere. Adventist missionary and his wife. They had done their stint in the mission field. They're going to go home. But folks who do their stint in the mission field usually have little money and jalopies to get around in. True story. Are these saints? I, I would say these are saints. These are people who love God, have been in service for God, and now a well-deserved, we're going home. Go see our family, go see our kids, see our friends. And he got somewhere in the middle of nowhere and the jalopy quit. What shall we do? Well, we can sit here, but it's evident that very few people come down this road. And we don't know how long. So the husband and the wife discussed the matter and they decided that she would remain with the vehicle, the jalopy, and all their stuff, all their wonderful stuff. And he would go hiking until he found some assistance and he would come back. When he came back, what do you suppose he found? His wife with her throat slit and all their stuff, be it whatever it was worth, is gone. How do you get the here and the after together in this? I, I mean, it's nice to go down the road, see somebody hurting and say, now you take care of this man. See, somewhere in life, we have to come to reality. We have to come to the point that we have to face reality. And as long as we are here, terrible things can happen. Why can they happen? Because God is the great protector and he is in charge of everything. No, he's not in charge of everything. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He is not in charge of everything. That is a misreading of Scripture. And it's only when we can understand what the here and the after really mean that we can face the here. Whatever it is, whatever it brings. See, you cannot reason out we're going home. And some people listening to a story like this, which by the way is a true story, some people listening to this say, well, she went home. Uh, I, I see here 
after years and years of reading here and these experiences and these stories and the here's and the afters, I see that sin has pushed, shoved, and forced God into a very unfriendly place. You've heard that you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. That's the position God is in. Everybody is expecting him to take care of them, to take care of their stuff, to take care of their family, to take care of the here and to take care of the after. And as long as we are here, we can see, but we're waiting for the crack of the bat. That's what we're waiting for. And so is God. And it's very important that we come to grips with some of these theological, spiritual realities. It's very important that we, that we understand where God is in these places. So I want to share a picture with you. We have, uh, we have on our, uh, not cable TV, but on our satellite TV, we have two or three history channels. And I'm a history bug. And uh, one of the more recent programs is taking the viewer on a tour around the world, around the world, but we're talking about history. And so what they are doing is showing you Central America and pyramids. They're showing you South America and pyramids. They're showing you pyramids in Egypt, the pyramids in Far East Asia, and pyramids and pyramids. Now they found pyramids underwater, a couple of hundred feet of water off the coast of Japan. Pyramids. And more recently, just underwater and right off the coast of East India, pyramids. And so they're going to discuss these findings with the viewer. And these experts come on and say, look, we have to be real honest with you. We don't know how primeval people, people who you know, weren't as smart as us, we don't, we don't know how they could move not 20 ton blocks of rock, but 200 ton blocks of rock. And so usually we have uh, 2,000 Egyptians and ropes, and that's how we're moving it. Look, there's not been enough thousands of years to move all those rocks and stack them so precisely and fit them so precisely that you cannot slip a sheet of paper or a knife blade between them. And so the conclusion of these experts is that these people were either superhuman or their visitors, there were visitors from other worlds who came here and showed them and instructed them and aided them and they built all these immense pyramids, and civilizations. So I'm going to take you back 2,000 years. So Jesus appears at the Jordan. Now there are a lot of people already there. They have been coming to hear John. And Jesus waits until the right moment to show himself at the Jordan. And a miracle occurred, otherwise John would not have known who he was. So God performed a double miracle. The double was, see the doves and hear the voice. Was that a here or an after? Two doves 
and a voice from heaven. So Jesus, following his baptism, is led, it says. Some versions say driven of the Holy Spirit, urged of the Spirit. He is led of the Spirit into the... Tell me what a wilderness is. That's where we live. Yes or no? Yeah. And by the way, that's a compound word. It's a wilderness. That's where we live. That's you and me. So Jesus goes into the wilderness there to be tempted of the devil, it says. You're hungry. You look hungry. You haven't had anything to eat. Here are some stones, and I know you have the power or authority to turn them to bread. Just say the word. Nope. Not going to get me on that one. One of the temptations that occurred in the wilderness was he took him up into a high place and he showed him all the pyramids, all the civilizations that were in high gear because in the History Channel dates most of these pyramid civilizations and they were about 2,000 years ago in there glory. Not all of them, but many of them. Wow. When did Jesus show up? He showed up when the devil was having a hay day. And what did Satan offer him? Just bow down, and I will share all of this glory with you. Did he claim that it was his? Did Jesus recognize that claim? The prince of this world. Are you listening? Don't miss it. These experts looking at these findings and cutting the jungle back and diving underwater and looking for clues to date these great civilizations and these great works of mankind, they basically go back about 2,000 years and everything has been Now that's interesting to me because Jesus, just before he died and just before he left here, said these words. Now is this world judged. So the power of the evil one over the minds and civilizations of the world has been being broken for 2,000 years. The here is on the way to the after. I'm trying to tell you that God is step by step by step breaking the grip of the satanic forces on the human races and the human civilizations down here. Well, he still has a lot of power. Of course he does. And until Jesus comes to break his grip entirely, he's going to have power and authority. Of course. But what you and I need to understand is that Jesus came here 2,000 years ago with the promise that in the fullness of time, the crack of the bat is going to reach us. If I go, I will come again. And when I come again, I will receive you unto myself so you can go with me. I find it very difficult to explain to other people 
what I see and what I feel about these things. Because the human experience down here is such that we don't want to wait. I, d I don't, don't, no, 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 no. Every day that Jesus doesn't come, I get older and I get more feeble and I, and I'm afraid, Patty, I'm afraid that all the prophecies we've been looking at and all the things we've been talking about, oh, we've only got a couple of hundred more years to go. I, I'm sorry, but that does not encourage me. It does not. I'm trying to understand what God is experiencing in all of this. And He is waiting for the fullness of time. Now, I close with this. I am thankful for my Advent background, my Adventist experience. I think that Adventists of all the Christian people, and there are many Christian people on this rock, of all the Christian people, have an opportunity to see and understand things about God and about what God is doing down here. I don't think we've gotten the here and the after together yet. I look at this and I see Michael standing because the property of God is threatened. The property of God. God did not declare war first. Satan declared war first. Then God met the challenge in the person of his son. Now you and I have been caught in the middle of all of this. That was never the intention or purpose or will of God. Never. But we've been caught up in it. And we're in the here moment. We wish we were in the after moment. We're not. But we are on the way. And when the here and the after come together is when Jesus stands, according to Revelation 11, is when Jesus stands and makes a pronouncement. And what is that pronouncement? It is finished. He that is righteous, let him be forever righteous. And he that is filthy, let him be forever filthy. That's the end. That's the end. I believe with everything in me that you and I are living watching, Jesus said, when you see, we're seeing. What we're waiting for is the crack of the bat. Kind Father in heaven, help us to understand that we are your children, that we are loved. We are endeared to your heart. Help us to understand that though the way may seem, seem long and weary, you're traveling with us. You are the good Samaritan. You have left instruction. Feed this man. Take care of this man. And if anything else is owed when I come, I'll pay it. We thank you. Help us to see your goodness and understand what I think we need to understand, that this is not your will, but you are fighting to bring your will to pass. And we can join you in this struggle willingly. And Jesus has asked that we become willing and faithful witnesses to his goodness his power, and his authority yet to come. Thank you for another Sabbath, for this hour, and for each one, and for this little community. And prayers are requested for Ivan and June, and for many whose names we could call here this morning. And I just ask you to bless them. And there are so many other requests you know each one, honor them 
with your goodness. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you.